Well, grace, mercy, and peace from God and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Some scripture passages kind of jump out from your memory. So this is congregational participation and see how well you do. John 3.16. Nobody heard of this? God so loved the world. Psalm 23. Lord is my shepherd. 1 Corinthians 13. Yep. Uh, so these are all familiar passages, and one of those other familiar passages should probably be Hebrews 11, our text for today. It's one of those famous chapters. It's often called the faith chapter because this entire chapter is devoted to this topic of faith. It's a favorite passage for many people because it not only explains and describes what faith is, but it gives many practical and concrete examples of people who lived uh, by faith. We don't know who wrote the book, uh, the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, it's an anonymous book. It wasn't Paul. We we're aware of that. But whoever it was was certainly inspired by the Holy Spirit, and God uh, obviously is the ultimate author uh, behind the book itself. Faith is foundational to our Christian life. You can't become a Christian without saving faith, right? Faith in Jesus Christ. And you can't live as a Christian without persevering faith. And you can't grow as a Christian spiritually unless you have faith. Faith is foundational to our Christian life. This chapter also gives us a good review of the Old Testament. The writer digs back into the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, that's why, of course, it's called Hebrews. Uh, goes back into the Scriptures for examples of people who lived as people of faith. And this is the only Bible that people in the first century church had because the New Testament was just in the process of being written. So it was the right place to go. Now, I'm old enough, and all of you know how old I am, to remember growing up in Sunday school days with flannel boards. Anyone else remember flannel boards and the little figures that would be moved around? Uh, not as exciting as 3D in Blu-ray and whatever the kids are learning. And I don't know how we're teaching kids today, but uh, not quite uh, as dramatic um, as in, in my day. But it did stretch my imagination a great deal, those flannel boards and moving those, you know, when the teacher picked me, I could move the move little figure from here to there. To this day, when I read about some of these characters, Samson or David or Joshua, I see those little figures on the green backboards. And as we grow older, these people seem at times to be larger than life for us. And their faith can seem out of reach. Like, how could we ever ascribe to a faith just as theirs. As much as we want to relate to them, we can't feel somehow disconnected, at least I did growing up. The image of Hebrews 11, as at least as it starts, and this is the second half of that uh, chapter. The uh, first half was in last week's readings. We, we did, not, uh, did not preach on. This image reminds me of the Greek gods on Mount Olympus who looked down on mere mortals and the foolishness of mortal life. Some people think that God is even like that, right? Aloof, removed, and different. But we all know that's not the story of Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews believed that the early church needed, though, to hear these stories once again. They were at risk for getting them, or even worse, becoming indifferent uh, to the faith of the past. Many people do that today. We need to tell one another the stories of faith, uh, to ask the hard questions, and to encourage one another in our own journeys. It's my story, it's our story, and it's also God's story. So I challenge you to think today, what is your story? What's your story? You know, that's, that's the easiest way to have a conversation with someone that you don't know. Just say, hi, my name is David. And you are George. Tell me your story, right? Tell me your story. Um, but what is our story? Now we've connected. Now we are starting to share a common story. 
But then, more importantly, what is God's story? My story is part of our story, and our story is ultimately part of God's story. Stories connect us. They remind us who we are and whose we are, where we have come from, what we have learned, what's important to those we love, how to inspire the deepest parts of our souls to encourage us to keep living, dreaming, and doing. Some stories will make us cry, while other stories will make us smile or even have a belly laugh until our belly hurts. Our whole life is a story in the making formed by the stories of others. And as we read uh, this letter to the Hebrews, uh, the background was a first century Christian congregation that was struggling. So this author of the letter, this anonymous author, draws their attention to the past. The stories shared in this passage were meant to encourage them, to offer them hope, to redirect them, to think about how their faith joins the stories of those who have gone before them and how those stories will then inform their own future. This faith helps them to focus on what it means to be followers or disciples of Jesus instead of being discouraged by present day circumstances. The author starts to remind them of key people who would play part of their history and of course also part of our history. By faith Moses led the people through the Red Sea. By faith the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, Rahab was obedient to receive people in her home, and so on and so forth. The list goes on for so long that the author basically says, look, these are the people who have all gone on before you. All of these people have their own story, and their story has become part of your story, our story. The writer encourages them to learn from the past, from their ancestors, so they can lean more fully into God's story. Mally Foskett writes that the key for the author of Hebrews is that faith discerns where real life is to be found, knows which values are true and which are counterfeit, and endures hardships in the face of divine promises. And just as stories of the Old Testament are meant to be examples, also people in the Old Testament are written to be examples as well. And here, the book of Hebrews points out specifically to their faith. That's why I emphasize that word, faith. In Hebrews 2, 11, 2, it says, What is it the ancients were commended for? Now, what is this, this? It is, of course, faith. It is this deep conviction in their hearts to believe in unseen realities, both present and future. It is in their conviction and in their assurance that God has produced in them an unshakable hope in God's promises. This word commended here means to receive a good report. And as kids are starting to think about going back to school, I'm going to give them the heebie-jeebies, and think about report cards. Oh. Now let's see how the report cards of these people in Hebrews did. When you look at these, you'll discover that as a whole, they didn't do all so well, did they? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, earlier in this uh, text, in, in uh, the first part of Hebrews 11, all failed miserably in the area of honesty. Moses flunked speech and didn't do well in the temper department either. Remember, uh, he killed a uh, Egyptian. Well, King David failed when it came to keeping his marriage promises. So when you read through the Old Testament, you don't find too many people who actually received straight A's when it came to the report of their lives. They all had failures and flaws. So, why is this author commending them there? Is it this good report? The good report was for one thing and one thing only. Their faith. It's what the ancients were commended for. Not living perfect lives. No, they were commended for their faith. For being sure of what they hoped for and certain of what they had not yet seen. They believed God 
even when they could not see the answer. Can you do that? Can you believe God? Can you trust in God? Even when you cannot yet see the answer. And they were commended for their faith as righteous. The righteous, the Bible says, will live by faith. And then the rest of Hebrews 11 is a running commentary on these verses. In the remaining verses of this chapter, the writer of Hebrews takes us through all of, starting in creation, all of these Old Testament uh, believers who exercised biblical faith and how it benefited them and ultimately the kingdom of God. And yet, it says, they lacked one thing, right? That is a saving faith in Jesus Christ. So, maybe we'll never be trying to pull the mouth of a lion apart. I hope I don't ever have to do that. Uh, or sawn in two. Did you hear that passage that Cindy read? Sawn in two? That's a, that's a kind of old-fashioned word. You know, cut in two. Like magicians do with the women, you know. Could I have a volunteer from the congregation to be sawn in two? I wouldn't, I wouldn't come up. I don't think any of those things are going to happen to me. A lot of them are or facing the edge of a sword. I hope that I'm not going to have any of those kinds of things. Perhaps the letter would sound more different if it would sound different if we would put our own names and our own circumstances in there. And then suddenly it would start to make a little more sense. So by faith, David survived being a single parent of three children with the help of many church members and friends. By faith, we learn to live stream worship. And that church was never about a building. Or, let's make it more personal to some of your lives. By faith, you survived counseling to, in order to save your marriage. Something that you didn't want to do. But you talked to Charlie or someone and now your marriage is stronger. By faith, you endured depression and anxiety and you sought out the help that you needed. By faith, you survived the path, the pains of loneliness in the darkest hours of the night. By faith, you pressed through the demands of work to make the right decisions when everybody else was making the wrong decisions and you knew it. By faith, you lay in that hospital room not sure what your life would be like after you had surgery. Faith is the foundation that gives strength to your hope. Faith is a deep conviction in your heart concerning realities that you cannot yet see. And I can be more confident with my story as a result, whatever that story may be. One filled with awesome things, one filled with hard and challenging things, struggles and celebrations, all of life's ups and downs. One of my favorite phrases is, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. Or we don't know what tomorrow will bring, but we know who will bring tomorrow. When we are faithful and honest with who we are, we can take a moment and reflect upon our stories, stories that have shaped us, and then we can ask the question, really, what is my story? And then we can know what is our story, the story of this faith community as we journey together, our story that involves great leaps of faith as we live more fully into what God is calling us to do and to be in our time and in our day. Our story involves people of all different walks of life with different life experiences. We're not all the same. We don't see things the same. We don't believe everything the same. But what we have in common is a faith and conviction to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And then we can see how my story and our story is part of God's story. Something much bigger than we can understand or imagine. God's story, one filled with redemption and reconciliation. Love and truth and freedom. Releasing our sin, which we cling to so closely. And opening our hearts and our hands to receive the abundant life that's promised to us in Christ Jesus. The pioneer and perfecter of our faith, Hebrews says. And we start to realize we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. 
I look out from my study every single day, and I see this cemetery, God's Acre. Going back to 1752, the great, I don't have to look up, I could just look here. This great cloud of witnesses who have gone on before us from one generation to the other here at Jordan, faithful in their calling, doing what they believed was the right thing to do in their time and in their day. And suddenly we realize that we are also one day going to be part of this great cloud of witnesses because of our faith in Christ. It is a story of victory through the cross and the empty tomb. When they were working on the movie Ben-Hur, remember that movie? Director Cecil B. DeMille asked Charlton Heston, the star of the movie, about this all-important chariot race at the end. You remember that. He decided that Heston should actually uh, learn to drive the chariot himself rather than having a stunt double do it for him. So he agreed to take, the actor agreed to take uh, lessons, chariot lessons, chariot driving lessons. How about that? I don't think you could Google. If you Google, I don't think you'd find it anymore, but back then you could. Uh, what did they make it look, that scene, that incredible scene, as authentic as possible? Learning to drive a chariot with horses, you know, four abreast, four, uh, is going to be um, no small matter. After extensive days of practice, Heston returned to the movie set and reported to DeMille. He said, I think I can drive the chariot all right, Cecil, but I'm not sure that I can actually win the race. Smiling slightly, DeMille said, Heston, you just stay in the race and we'll make sure you win. I think those are the words of God to each and every one of us. Sisters and brothers, stay in the race in Jesus Christ and you will win. It's all a matter of our faith and our trust in a faithful God who is bigger than our needs. I want to close with these words by Colton Dixon. Uh, it's um, a contemporary Christian song. I will build a boat in the sand where they say it never rains. I will stand up in faith. I will do everything it takes. With your wind in my sails, your love never fails or fades. I'll build a boat in a desert place. And when the flood and the water start to rise, yeah, I'll ride the storm, because you've got me by your side. With your wind and by sails, your love never fails or fades. I'll build a boat, so let it rain. May you have that faith in your heart and in your life this day of the one who is able. Amen.